it's a well-known fact of history that uh, Leibniz uh, discovered uh, calculus. Uh, so you, you, you had Isaac Newton who discovered it, but also Leibniz simultaneously discovered it, and there was a bit of a uh, debate, uh, I suppose, at that time between them, you, you know, who really should be given the, the, the credit as the discoverer. Uh, what's less well known is, I, I think, is, is that uh, Leibniz was a co-discoverer, or at least a follower, apparently, of the um, theological uh, doctrine of uh, middle knowledge and Molinism. Uh, Louis D. Molina, did he play Dr. Octopus in Spider-Man 2? Anyways, um, he, he was the uh, kind of the, the founding father of this uh, view called, which we call Molinism. And people, uh, even his fellow uh, Jesuits, uh, uh, seemed to have forgotten this doctrine, and it was rediscovered in our own day by Alvin Plantinga. That, that's kind of the general story. But uh, in, in reading a book, um, The Oxford History of Western Philosophy, edited by Anthony Kenny, um, and the chapter on Leibniz is written by Anthony Kenny, um, it, it seems that, that Leibniz... Uh, if not originating the idea, at least subscribe to this idea of of uh, middle knowledge and Molinism. Uh, so I just wanted to read a quote. Uh, uh, Kenny, uh, starting on page 154, is talking about the monadology, a very important uh, writing of Leibniz's. And then in the course of talking about the monadology, this whole question of free will uh, came up. And of course, uh, Calvinists and Arminians have been arguing about that for a long time uh, in, theological, in the theological realm. Uh, is God sovereign or is man free? And they have different answers for that. Uh, the, Mo the, the Molinist position is that uh, God, yes, God is sovereign, but he uses his middle knowledge uh, to create... Uh, a a world in which people freely choose what they want to do in accordance with his sovereign will. Uh, so it kind of splits the the that kind of synthesizes, uh, to use the Hegelian term, uh, it synthesizes the Calvinism on the one hand and the Arminianism on the other hand. Uh, so uh, Leibniz was talking about the monadology, um, and, and Kenny was 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 talking about what Leibniz had to say about that. Um, and in the course of that, as I said, uh, he, he raises the question of free will. So uh, Kenny writes on page 155 and following, uh, does Leibniz's system leave room for free will? It seems that uh, the teachings in the monadology, a book of, of Leibniz's, takes away human free will. Um, uh, he continues, Human beings, like all agents, finite or infinite, need a reason for acting. That is Leibniz's principle of sufficient reason. But in the case of free agents, he maintains, the motives which provide the sufficient reason incline without necessitating. But it is hard to see how he can make room for a special kind of freedom for human beings. In his system, no agent of any kind is acted on from outside. All are completely self-determining. But no agent, whether rational or not, can step outside the life uh, history laid out for it in the pre-established harmony. Hence, it seems that the freedom to act upon one's motives is an, illusor is an illusory liberty. So, given... <coughs> That's Sorry about that. I dropped my microphone. Uh, given that the monadology is true, if, if we assume that what he says, what Leibniz says in the monadology is true, 
um, it seems that that takes away human freedom. Uh, and now, um, I think I think this is what Kenny, what, what I'm about about to read, is what Kenny sa is saying that Leibniz should have said. Um, so this isn't necessarily what Leibniz himself thought or, or explicitly wrote or said, uh, but th this is this is what he could have said. Um, but I, I think to a certain extent uh, this is is consistent with the thought of Leibniz. Uh, so Kinney continues, to respond to this objection against free will, Leibniz needs to have recourse to his picture of the relationship between God and the universe. Before deciding to create the world, God surveys the infinite number of possible creatures. Among the possible creatures, there will be many possible Julius Caesars. And among these, there will be one Julius Caesar who crosses the Rubicon and one who does not. Each of these possible Caesars will act for a reason, and neither of them will be necessitated. There is no law of logic saying that the Rubicon will be crossed or that it will not be crossed. When, therefore, God decides to give existence to the Rubicon crossing Caesar, he is making an actual he was making actual a freely choosing Caesar. Hence, our actual Caesar crossed the Rubicon freely. So, uh, Caesar had the free will to cross it. He chose to cross it. And God's middle knowledge told him which potential Caesar to create who would freely choose that. But what of God's own choice to give existence to the actual world we live in, in contrast to the myriad of other possible worlds he might have created? Was there a reason for that choice, and was it a free choice? Leibniz's answer is that God chose freely to make the best of all possible worlds. So it's interesting, though Leibniz perhaps didn't uh, explicitly use the word Molinism, that uh, his language of the best of all possible worlds, uh, we find there uh, some type of, of appeal to uh, the Molinistic uh, doctrine. Uh, so, uh, speaking about the best of all possible worlds, uh, Kenny continues to write, Not all things which are possible in advance can be made actual together. In Leibniz's terms, A and B may each be possible, but A and B uh, may not be compossible, uh, so possible simultaneously. They're, they're not possible simultaneously, uh, perhaps. Any created world is therefore a system of compossibles, and the best possible world is the system which has the greatest surplus of good over evil, a world in which there is free will, which is sometimes sinfully misused, is better than a world in which there is neither freedom nor sin. Hence, the evil in the world provides no argument against the goodness of God, because God is good, and necessarily good, he chooses the most perfect world, Yet he acts freely, because although he cannot create anything but the best, he need not have created at all. Then Kenny goes on to contrast uh, Leibniz's view uh, that the world we live in is the best of all possible worlds uh, with Descartes and Aquinas. And then he talks about uh, the Candide, where, where uh, Voltaire is uh, making fun of, of this world being the best of all possible worlds, and and so on. And then shortly after that, he, he switches over to talking about Hume. Uh, so I, I just I think it's interesting that uh, in Leibniz, uh, with his idea of the best of all possible worlds, we find the uh, the Molinism, which was uh, developed. Uh, by the Jesuit de Molina, and is popularized today by William Lane Craig and, and others, because um, we, we don't normally think of Leibniz as being a Molinist. Thank you. Comments welcome. Uh, shalom out.